Greetings! This is a Griffin 5000 volt laboratory power supply, scavenged from a skip. For those watching overseas, Griffin and George was a supplier of science teaching and laboratory equipment. Those who were in school in the 80s and 90s may remember a lot of this stuff in their laboratories. It seems in pretty good condition, on the outside at least, apart from that the switch is broken. So I need to take a look at that. Next to the switch, there's a neon power indicator and a fuse holder with a one amp fuse. Elsewhere on the front, there are terminals for a center tap supply of up to 5,000 volts with or without an additional 50 mega ohms of resistance on each side. There's a control knob to adjust the voltage and a meter to show what it's up to. There are also two low voltage supplies, one of 12 volts AC up to three amps and one at 6.3 volts AC to power things such as valve heaters. Oh, and an earth terminal. The high voltage output normally has no reference to earth, but a jumper cable can be plugged in if it's needed. Flip it over and we have a serial number sticker. Whether that's just a generic serial number or this really is a really low numbered unit, I don't know, because the serial number is just E. We also have a circuit diagram. This simplifies some of the parts as there are resistors on the diagram which are actually strings of resistors in real life, but it's a handy diagram for troubleshooting if it's been abused in service. Let's take a look inside and see if you can figure out how old it is. Before I do though, there's a clue as to the youngest it could be. Look at the cable. That cable colour code was only permitted until the 1st of April 1971, so that's the newest this unit can be. It's at least 50 years old. The first thing that catches your eye when taking the lid off is this set of four capacitors. They're all TCC cathode rate viscanol condensers, each rated at a quarter of a microfarad at two and a half kilovolts or three kilovolts if running a little cooler. Viscanol capacitors were introduced in the late 1940s. Here's an article in the August 1948 edition of Wireless World magazine and an advert from the March 1949 issue. Incidentally, if you want to dive into the world of early electronics where it seems pretty much every circuit had hundreds of volts running through it, worldradiohistory.com has PDF scans of dozens of these old magazines. Now, as it's an oil and paper capacitor, obviously there's old oil inside, but is it PCB oil? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. There's a lot of conflicting evidence out there. The United Nations Environment Programme don't list viscanol as a PCB mixture. ANZEC have produced a list of various capacitors and have four viscanol caps in their green list of PCB free capacitors. However, they do have the CP5700 in their red list of PCB containing capacitors. The caps in this unit are CP57HO, which is the same family. At least they're not leaking and I don't intend chopping them open. As long as they don't go bang, they should be fine, I think. Right at the end of that information on the side of the capacitor is a pretty big clue. ZG is a date code. Z is 1968. G is the seventh letter of the alphabet, so the seventh month. So we've now got a date of manufacture for the whole unit is somewhere between July 1968 and April 1971. Now before we go any further, take a look at this. These caps are all mounted on what I guess is a tough null sheet as the old radio magazines I've been digging through for info are crammed with adverts for this stuff. Never mind what it is though, look at the creepage distance. Now this is normally floating free from mains voltage, so some of these gaps wouldn't matter. How about now? There's two and a half kilovolts across there now. Either I'm underestimating the performance of this stuff, or this particular unit has perhaps never been run with its outputs at plus or minus 5,000 volts relative to ground. What else is in here? Well, there's a circuit board with two huge diodes. Again, you've got to go digging through the archives to find anything out about these. They're branded STC, which was standard telephones and cables. They were part of ITT Corporation, hence this ITT datasheet containing the details. These particular ones are the K8120, rated at 8,150 volts at five milliamps. Also on the board are a bunch of resistors. Due to the voltages involved, these resistor strings are used so there's normally only a few hundred volts across each instead of needing single resistors rated at several thousand volts. Crunching the numbers brings up the voltages across each resistor and throws up an interesting little quirk. If you use both 100 microamp outputs, you've got 100 meg ohms of resistance in the way, 50 meg each side, which at 5,000 volts only gives you 50 microamps. 
The only way you'll get 100 microamps out of a 100 microamp output is if the other side of the load is to bypass half of these resistors by using one of the 3 milliamp outputs. But this then means it's up to 1000 volts across each of these resistors, although the power dissipation is still quite low at 0.1 watts. Elsewhere inside we have a pair of voltage selectors. One is for the high voltage transformer, the other for the low voltage transformer. Inside they're like a sort of valve base with a pair of pins on this rotary plug that connects two pins together to select the supply voltage in use, either 240, 220 or 200 volts. Near these we've got two transformers. This one provides the low voltage fixed output. This one provides the high voltage output, which is controlled by adjusting the voltage across the transformer primary. If we take a look down here, we can see that that voltage control is actually a small variac. None of these other devices appear to have any date information on them, nor does the case. So it looks like July 1968 to April 1971 is as close as we're going to be able to narrow this down. And that's pretty much all that's in here. As I've got the lid off, I'm going to fix or replace the switch now, and I'm going to change out the cable while I'm at it. Once that's done, I'll take it outside to test, as I don't want the caps exploding or the whole thing catching fire in the house. That's what the front garden's for. Once the cable changed, with a nice moulded plug on the replacement, I took a kettle lead and just chopped the plug off and fitted that in. The switch itself had a broken pin, the sort of axle in the, um, in the toggle. Fortunately, that pin is about the same size as the pin on a small cable clip. So I've taken one of those, cut it to size, and fitted it in there, and the switch is now spot on. Let's take it outside and power it up. And we'll see if it can run all the way up. Oh, yes. 70 volts in. Oh, he's on his own. 120 volts in. Bang. So 240 volt input. Two seventy volt input for five thousand volt output. As you can see takes a little while to run back down to be somewhere safe. How about with that ground reference on one side though? You can handle it. Not tracking. So there you go, a 50 year old Griffin 5000 volt power supply. And as far as I can tell, it's working fine. Thanks for watching.